Tonight's presentation is what plane should I buy? Of course, we have Mike Bush, president of Savvy Aviation as our speaker. He always does the first Wednesday of the month webinar. He's an author of numerous aviation publications, several books. He's a CFI. He's an A&P mechanic with inspection authorization. He was the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year in 2008. And of course, he's an EA member. And again, you will be able to see Mike live at AirVenture. He's going to do a full slate of presentations. So definitely put that on the calendar for 53 days from now. Good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, tonight, we're going to talk about what airplane should I buy? Um, it, this has been a very unusual time in general aviation. I've been involved in GA for a long time, 55 years or something like that. And um, you know, we were always really quite interested in what the effect of the COVID lockdown was going to be on, on general aviation uh, being now in the business. Um, and it was a big surprise. Um, it, it, it was actually pretty much of a boom time from my perspective. And the thing that was most extraordinary that I found was that a gigantic number of general aviation airplanes were bought and sold uh, in 2020. Um, I'm guess it's, guessing it's related to COVID. It's not entirely clear to me why this happened, but everybody I talked to had the same experience that there's been an absolute explosion in um, buying and selling general aviation airplanes uh, lately. Um, the way my company gets involved in this is that, is that we manage a lot of pre-buys. So, so we typically are talking to prospective buyers of, of these airplanes and um, we, uh, we, we help them decide what to buy and then we help arrange a, a pre-buy examinations for them. Um, and in 2019, before all of this madness started, um, we were typically managing about 10 pre-buys per month. It varied up and down a little bit, but that was generally what we were looking at. By the summer 2020, um, our pre-buy business had gone up 500%. We were managing around 50 pre-buys a month. It was frantic. I mean, we were we were hiring A and PIAs and stuff like crazy to try to keep up with the demand. And even now, it's it's dropped off a little bit, but we're, we're still doing 40 some odd pre-buys a month. So the, the the buying and selling activity in GA has just been absolutely amazing. Um, and as I said, we normally deal with the buyers in these transactions. And a significant number of these buyers are first first time airplane buyers. Um, and they need a lot of help. Um, they, they, they get into this thing, they decide they wanna buy an airplane. Uh, nowadays you go online to, you know, these various websites, aircraft shopper online, controller, trade a plane, barnstormers, and you see this overwhelming number of possible purchase candidates. Um, I mean, it used to be back in the old days, you, when you buy an airplane, you, you would look for airplanes kind of in your general neck of the woods. But now you're dealing with a, you know, with a nationwide online market, sometimes even a worldwide market. We, we we're having quite a few people who are, you know, either in the U.S. buying airplanes out of Canada or vice versa, um, and it's it it can be very bewildering for a first-time aircraft buyer. So, a, a lot of these buyers um, come to us asking for some guidance, saying, you know, well, what you know, what airplane should I buy? I've never owned an airplane before. I know I want to buy an airplane, but I'm not sure what I ought to buy. Um, and there are all these decisions, you know, high wing, low wing, retractable or fixed, single or twin, turbocharger normally aspirated. And then when they figure out kind of what makes and models they're interested in, then they are dealing with, you know, airplanes that have high time or low time airframes, high time or low time engines, you know, uh, paint and interior in various kinds of different conditions and so on. And, and they're trying to make sense of all of this and, and, and narrow things down to, you know, one or two viable purchase candidates. So when I'm talking to a prospective buyer, and particularly a first time buyer who's never done this before, the, the first thing I try to get them to nail down is, is what, their, what their mission is. How, 
how are they going to how are they planning to use this airplane what what's the typical mission going to be um and of course there's all sorts of possible answers to this uh, are they going to be using it for uh, as a pure recreational thing uh they're going to use it to fly friends and family off on 100 dollar hamburger jaunts on weekends are they going to be doing serious cross country travel is it going to be mostly vfr or are they going to be dealing with with serious weather um you know i i have always since since i first became an aircraft owner at age 25 back in the, the late 60s uh, i've always used my airplane for for serious travel and uh, actually this this past year is the first year i can think of in memory that that i didn't make at least one or two transcontinental scope trips i i I'm based in California. Uh, you know, I fly to Hitchcock every year. I typically fly to Boston every year because my sisters live there. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, uh, Virginia in my airplane in, uh, in October. Um, but not everybody makes long trips like that. That's just the way I use my airplane. That's my mission profile. But not everybody is like that. So some people only fly in good weather. Some people fly fairly short distances. I try to get an idea of, of, of what kind of um, uh, trip distance they, they, they're typically going to be flying. Uh, how often are they going to be flying uh, more than a thousand nautical miles away from home base? Um, that being like a distance where you need to make at least one fuel stop typically. Um, I fly trips over a thousand nautical miles all the time, but not everybody does. A lot of people never fly trips that long. How often will they be going more than 500 nautical miles, more than 200 nautical miles? You get some idea of how they're going to be using the airplane and who are they going to be carrying in the airplane? Are they going to be flying mostly solo? Or are they going to be carrying family? If they're going to be carrying family, how big is the family? How many adults? How many kids? What do they weigh? How much luggage are they going to bring along? Try to get some idea of, of what size and weight carrying capability they need in an airplane. And then, of course, the question is, you know, what's the budget? Um, um, what what are they planning to spend to purchase the airplane and, and maybe refurbish it, uh, you know, upgrade the avionics, uh, upgrade the paint interior, whatever they're planning to do? And then what do they expect to be spending um, annually for operation and maintenance? And most first time aircraft owners have some number in mind in terms of purchase price. They haven't really thought about operating costs. And you know, there, there are a lot of airplanes on the market that are very, very inexpensive to buy and will eat you out of house and home every year uh, in terms of operation maintenance. So it's very important that, that, that you know, we get a handle on how much they have to spend on this on this airplane. Um, and how long do they expect to keep the airplane? Um, is, is this an airplane they're, they're, they're planning to buy, keep a few years, um, you know, maybe get their instrument rating or something and then trade up to something um, more, you know, faster or, or uh, with higher performance or larger size cabin or something? Or are they looking to buy an airplane, keep it for a long time? because that makes a big difference as far as what kind of airplane they ought to be buying. And then I would like to know how maintenance involved the, the, the owner plans to be. Are, are, are they gonna be working on their airplane at all? Are they gonna do owner assisted annuals, which I always encourage owners to do, but not every owner wants to do that. Are they gonna be doing most of their own preventive maintenance, oil changes and that sort of thing, or are they gonna leave that to, to a mechanic? Um, so get some idea of, 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 you know, how involved in the maintenance process they plan to be and how much of the maintenance they're going to be leaving to others to do. One, one of the things that I find is that particularly first time buyers of airplanes very frequently seem to want to buy more airplane than they need. Um, they have this idea that they're going to buy an airplane, they're going to keep it for a long time. Um, they want it to be fast, they want it to be roomy. They go looking through all of these uh, websites to, and, and they find that there are lots of older, 
high performance single engine airplanes, older Moonies, older Cessna 210s, that sort of thing, that seem to be priced very, very inexpensively for you know, how capable an airplane they are. Um, and they get this idea that, you know, they'll they'll buy one of these inexpensive, older, high performance airplanes. They'll put some money into bringing the panel up to date and so on, and then they'll keep it for a long time. And if they keep pursuing things, they'll notice that piston twins are for sale sometimes at lower prices than high performance single engine airplanes. And they'll be tempted to, to buy a twin because, wow, that, that's a lot of airplane and for not very much money. Uh, and I have to explain to them that these airplanes are cheap for a reason. They're, they're, they're cheap because they're very, very expensive to own. They may be inexpensive to buy, but they can be very expensive to own. And they can be very painful to own, too. Um, so most of the time, if I'm talking to a first-time buyer, um, I try to talk them out of doing this. Um, I explain that the purchase price is just a small down payment on what the total cost of ownership is going to be. And that the older the airplane and the more complicated the airplane, the higher the maintenance cost is going to be. Um, and if the airplane is old enough or if it's an airplane that, that is no longer supported by the factory, as quite, quite a lot of different makes and models no longer in production, um, it can be very, very difficult because parts can be extremely expensive or even unobtainable. And trying to keep the airplanes airworthy uh, keeps getting more and more and more difficult. Um, also, the, the, the higher performance the airplane, um, and particularly if it's a retractable or a twin, insurance can be very expensive and insurance might not even be obtainable until the owner has a certain amount of time and type. So if he gets something too elaborate, he may wind up having to fly with a CFI for a long time before he can uh, before he, he, he can fly it by himself and, and be insured. Um, first time buyers, um, because they're first time, first time owners, um, are bound to make a lot of mistakes while they're learning the ropes of aircraft ownership. You know, I, I, I always like to say that being an aircraft owner is one of the hardest jobs in aviation um, because you have so much responsibility and you have so many decisions that you have to make. And yet it's just about the only job in aviation for, for which there's no training. You know, there, it, when we want to become a pilot, we go through all sorts of training and testing and, and you know, recurrent training and stuff. If you want to become a mechanic, a parachute rigger, an air traffic controller. You have to go through all sorts of training and testing and get a certificate and everything. But to be an aircraft owner, you just write a check and voila, you're an aircraft owner. And, and you haven't really gone through any training of how to be an aircraft owner and how to make all these decisions. And so first time aircraft owners tend to make lots of mistakes. And that's just part of the learning curve. That's the way we learn by making mistakes. But the thing is, if you have a high performance, complicated airplane, the cost of making those mistakes, the cost of the tuition can be very high. If you've got a nice, simple airplane that, that for where the you know, parts are readily available and any mechanic can work on them and the systems are, are simple, um, then you can make mistakes and you know, it, it, it won't, it, it won't cost you fortune you know, while you're learning the ropes of how to, how to be a, you know, a seasoned, experienced um, aircraft owner who knows how to make these decisions. So for all these reasons, I usually try to steer first timers towards something simple, uh, typically some fixed gear single engine airplane as their first airplane. And I say, don't, don't buy this airplane planning to keep it for the rest of your life. Buy this airplane as the as the airplane that you learn how to be an owner. Keep it for a few years, and and then if your ownership experience is is good and things have stabilized and you feel confident, that then you can always upgrade to something more complicated and capable. But <clears throat> start simple. Start with something that 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 isn't going to get you in serious trouble. So 
you know, if we're looking at certificated airplanes, which is typically what my company deals with mostly, um, for somebody who is who their primary mission is is you know VFR flying, relatively short trips, uh, uh, maybe training, using it to get their instrument rating or something. Something simple, you know, like a Cessna 172 or a Piper Archer or a Grumman Tiger, something like that, um, is, a, is a very good choice. It's a simple airplane. Uh, anybody can work on it. They're inexpensive to insure. Um, and the maintenance cost tends to be pretty low. Um, you know, they've got these little rock solid four cylinder Lycoming engines that nothing ever goes wrong with. Uh, they they don't have complicated systems. They don't have a gear retraction system to work uh, to to worry about. Um, it's, they're, they're they're nice and simple and relatively low parts count, and you know reasonably maintainable. And they, they they're they're all you really need for 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 that mission. And it's a good starting airplane for somebody who is a first time buyer, but is instrument rated, wants to use the airplane for serious travel, wants to use the airplane for, for flying in, in IMC, then I, I would recommend something like a Cessna 182, uh, Piper Dakota. Um, uh, if, if their budget allows it, one of the older Cirrus SR-22s, although that's a fair amount more expensive than the, than the other two here. Um, you know, the Skyline and Dakota, again, they're simple airplanes. Every mechanic knows how to work on them. Parts are readily available. Uh, and, and these are airplanes that, uh, unlike the ones on the previous slide, that they, they're, they're rock solid instrument platforms. They'll basically lift anything you can close the doors on. Um, and uh, they're, they're just an, an excellent choice. Um, my first airplane was a Cessna 182. Um, which I bought in 1968. Uh, flew it coast to coast, I don't know how many times. Flew it in all sorts of pretty serious instrument weather. Got my instrument instructor rating in it. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a marvelous airplane. And after a few years, I you know, sort of got the inevitable need for speed and I, I traded up to something faster. But um, it, it's a great first airplane. So I, I always try to steer owners to something that's relatively simple and won't eat them out of a house and home. Um, and, and I try to keep to, to have them think that this is not the airplane they're going to keep for the rest of their life. This is the airplane that they're starting their journey on as an aircraft owner. And then maybe their next airplane after a few years will, will be, you know, something a little more complicated and a little faster and so on. But at least by then they'll be fairly experienced. They'll they'll have developed a relationship with a with a shop or mechanic that they really trust, and and they'll they'll understand how to how to make all of the decisions that aircraft owners are are uh, called on to make. Um, you know, we, we all tend to feel the need for speed when we when we when we want to buy an airplane. We always want to go fast, but you know, speed is expensive, and it's not that important if you aren't flying real long distances. Um, you know, for example, uh, if your typical mission profile is like a 500 nautical mile cross country, um, and an awful lot of the owners that I talk to don't fly further than that, that that's a fairly long trip for them. Um, you know, if you if you did it in a in a Cessna 210, which is a 165 knot air, airplane, it would take you about three and a quarter hours. Um, if you did it in a Cessna Skylane, which is a 135 knot airplane, it's a much simpler airplane. It's got a fixed gear and so on. It would take you another half hour. But the difference is that the that the Centurion is going to be is going to have a, a cost of ownership at least twice what the Skylane is going to have. So is it really worth having twice the, the, the operating cost and twice the maintenance cost and twice the insurance cost to save that half hour? Uh, most owners don't really go through this exercise, but you know, this, unless you're traveling very long distances, 
um, the speed isn't that important. Now, when I fly coast to coast and I'm, and it's a 2000 or 2500 nautical mile trip, it, it did take quite a long, a lot longer in the sky lane than it does in my Cessna 310 now. But, but for, you know, the kinds of trips that most people take, because there aren't a lot of people like me that, that, that take these multi thousand mile trips on a regular basis. Um, the, the, the speed is, is less important and it, and it may not be worth the, the, the added expense, especially if you're a first time owner. So, you know, my ownership trajectory, I've owned three airplanes. Um, my first airplane was a Cessna 182. Uh, eventually I sold it for a faster airplane, a Belanca Super Viking, which is, you know, sort of competitive with a Bonanza, that kind of class airplane. And then ultimately I, I traded up to the Cessna 310, which I've now owned for whatever it is, 32 years. <laughs> I've had it for a long time. Um, and it's a wonderful airplane. All these airplanes have treated me very well. And the 310 has been a fabulous airplane. Um, I couldn't afford it if I didn't do all the maintenance on it myself, I must confess, because it's a very complicated airplane. It's got way too many moving parts. Um, and to be honest with you, at this stage of my life, it's a lot more airplane than I need. And if I, if I didn't have like a million hours of sweat equity on the thing, and if for some reason I was in the market for an airplane today, I would not buy any twin. Um, I would probably buy something like an older Cessna, a uh, Cirrus SR-22, because I, that, that's the airplane that, if I do this exercise myself and I say, what's my mission profile and so on, uh, that airplane would, would fit my needs very well. And the 310 is really more than I need. So why do I still own the 310? Just, because I'm stupid, I guess. <laughs> I've just owned it for so long that the thought of parting with it was it was difficult, but that's not a very rational reason. So once we get some idea of what sort of make and model we're looking for, then the next question is, um, how do you find a good purchase candidate? Because if you're you know looking for a 182 or you know a Mooney or something you're gonna, they're gonna have an awful lot of them to choose from. So let's talk about a, a few of the considerations. Um, one thing that tends to scare buyers off is an airplane that has a high time engine engine that's at or near, or maybe even over TBO. Um, and inexperienced buyers often shy away from aircraft listings that have high time engines. Um, I think that that is exactly wrong. Um, I actually think that the best way to buy an airplane is one with a high time engine for reasons that I'll mention in a minute. Um, but the inexperienced buyers tend to shy away from airplanes with high time engines because they think, oh my God, I'm gonna have to buy this thing and then I'm gonna have to shell out a whole bunch of money to overhaul the engine. But what they don't consider is the fact that the, the fair market value of an airplane um, almost always has engine time fully reflected in the selling price. And if the airplane is, is offered for sale and it's got an engine that's at or close to TBO, um, it's the, the, the value of the airplane is going to be written down to just core engine value. It's a very easy calculation to make. And it, it's, it's, you know, virtually always um, reflected fairly in a reduced selling price. The higher the time on the engine, the, the lower the selling price of the airplane. So it, it, it shouldn't be a financially scary thing to buy an airplane with a high time engine because you're gonna buy it on the cheap and then you're gonna have to pay for the overhaul and you're gonna wind up spending between the two of those things about the same as you would if you bought an airplane with a low time engine. Um, so I think I just said that. <laughs> But, uh, and, and I'm convinced that actually that buying an airplane with a, with a run out engine, meaning an engine that's at or close to TBO, maybe a little over TBO, um, is the best way to buy an airplane. It's got a lot of advantages. First of all, you'll get to choose what you want when you replace the engine. If you want a factory rebuilt, you get a factory rebuilt. If you want an engine from, you know, 
Victor Aviation with everything ported and polished and powder coated and everything, you get, you get what you want. If you want the Bendix S1200 mags instead of slick mags or whatever, you're you're going to be doing redoing the engine. You're going to get exactly the engine you want. Whereas if you let the seller replace the engine, he's going to pick whatever engine he wants to put in there. And if he knows he, he's about to sell the airplane, he's probably going to do whatever the cheapest thing is. Um, Another advantage of buying an airplane with a run out engine is that the seller is usually very motivated to sell because he's at a point where he's either going to either has to sell the airplane or he's got to put a whole bunch of money in it. So he's, he's typically easier to deal with and, and, and you're likely to be able to bargain with him better as far as getting a good price. And the last advantage of buying an airplane with a run out engine is that there's no law that says that that engine's going to have to get overhauled very anytime soon. Um, you know, I, I took the engine on my Cessna 310 to 225% of TBO. So, um, you know, you might find that that, that that engine, especially if you're buying one of these airplanes with, with a small Lycoming in it, because, you know, 0320s, 0360s, those sorts of engines, you know, if, if they're flown frequently and they don't aren't allowed to corrode, um, they have a 2,000 hour TBO. We see them go to 4,000 hours plus all the time. Um, so you might wind up with a windfall. The the air the the engine time the engine I mean the the aircraft will be written down to core value because the engine is at or close to TBO, but you might be able to fly that airplane for years and years and years and years. Uh, beyond TBO before you have to put any money into it. Um, so when you combine all of these things, it seems to me that that uh, the best way to buy a, an airplane is one with a run-out engine. The worst, the, the the worst way to buy an airplane, in my um, judgment, is to buy it with a with an engine that's somewhere between freshly overhauled and run out, some kind of a mid-time engine. Because if you buy an airplane with a mid-time engine, you're going to be paying a significant amount of money for that engine because it will not have been written down to core value. But you have no idea how much time you have left before be, before overhaul because you typically don't have any idea how that engine's been treated. Sometimes it's it's hard to tell whether the engine has been has been a been active or has been allowed to sit or whatever. We we try to do a lot of logbook research when we manage pre-buys to try to determine that sort of thing. But the, the the life of an engine is largely dependent on on how it was operated and how frequently it was operated and how long it has been allowed to sit and what uh, environmental conditions it was sitting in. Whether you know if it was sitting around in Denver, it's a lot better than if it was sitting sitting around in Miami. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty when you're buying an airplane with a mid-time engine because you're 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 paying a fair amount for that engine, but you don't really know how much life you can expect out of it. And there's the the likelihood of downside surprises is significant. When you buy an airplane with a run-out engine, the only kind of surprise you can get is an upside surprise. That is, wow, that that engine's is is still healthy. I can fly it a lot longer. <clears throat> so at any rate, um that that's that's my thought about high time engines. I like to buy airplanes with high time engines. I bought my Cessna 310 with uh, 100 hours from TBO, um, and I got a big windfall because I got to fly it for a long time after that after I bought it. But the owner was very motivated to sell because he had this twin with two engines that were 100 hours from TBO, and his mentality is, I either got to sell this airplane or I've got to pay a hundred thousand dollars to overhaul two engines so he was very motivated to sell which was a good thing for me um okay let's talk about high time airframes that that's a that's a more difficult issue than high time engines it's more complicated <clears throat> because um you know unlike um engine time which we can roll back just by overhauling the engine it's very hard to roll back airframe time. It is what it is. If the air, if the, if the airframe has 7,000 hours on it, it's got 7,000 hours on it. 
Uh, it's not economically feasible to turn it back into a zero time airframe the way it is uh, with an engine. Um, now, high airframe time is not necessarily a bad thing because uh, an airplane with, with high airframe time probably has been flown regularly and often throughout its life, and, and, and that's a good thing. In, in fact, it might have been a working airplane, might have, might have been in a, in a flight school or a charter operation or flying you know, night, checks at night or something like that. And those airplanes have the best chance of lasting a long time. They, they, they fly regularly, they typically get you know, um, a higher quality of maintenance, the most important thing is they don't sit around, uh, so they don't have an opportunity to, to corrode. Um, in fact, an airplane with unusually low hours, which it tends to be very attractive to first time buyers, is often one that you should be suspicious of because it, it's typically one that's had lengthy periods of disuse where it didn't fly much or maybe it didn't even fly at all. And unless those, that, that, that this use was in a dry climate or stored in a heated hangar someplace, um, that low time airframe is a likely candidate for having hidden corrosion, corrosion damage and that can get very expensive and in some cases it can be uneconomical to repair. Um, now look at the, at the opposite end of the envelope, very high time airframes um, is one of these things that kind of depends. Um, for a lot of the time that I've been an aircraft owner, the, the conventional wisdom was that airframes would pretty much last forever if we didn't let them corrode. Um, and that may still be turn out to be true for some airframes like strut braced high wing airplanes like Cessnas and so on that, that, that tend to last pretty much forever. But in recent years, there's been increasing concern over the fatigue life of cantilever wing airplanes, that is wings, the, the airplanes with wings that don't have struts and where the, the spar and spar carry through section is supporting all of the weight. And there have been some very costly ADs affecting some of the, some of the Beach Cessna and Piper airplanes that are cantilever wing airplanes. Um, um, and as time goes on, the, the, there'll probably be, be more of those. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're what you're looking to buy as to how much of a concern a very high time airframe is. If it's a Cessna 182, I wouldn't worry about it. If it's a Cessna 210, I would worry about it. Um, so the, kind of the bottom line is you, sh you probably shouldn't pay a premium for an ultra low time airframe. And you might even do well to be suspicious of an ultra low time airframe because it probably has been sitting around a fair amount during its life. And really, Probably the best bet is to look for a mid-time airframe that has hours commensurate with its chronological age, indicating that it's been flown regularly and often 100 hours a year at least would be nice, um, or, or one that's been that, that, that spent most of its life in a very, very dry climate where corrosion is not an issue. So that, that, that's, that's my take on, on airframe age. Like I say, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, there, there are no like really easy answers, but um, very low time airframes can be problematic. Very high time airframes can be problematic if the airplane is, uh, is has a cantilever wing, and a mid time airframe is is probably the most attractive thing to to consider. Talk a little bit about older airplanes. And by older, I mean chronologically older as opposed to hours. Um, figuring out what model year to buy. Market value tends to drop precipitously with calendar age. If you look at, at a particular model like a Cessna 182 or a PA 28 235 or something, um, the, the earlier the model year, um, the, the lower the price typically. Um, and you may occasionally see older airplanes that have been well maintained and are corrosion free, but because they're very early model years, uh, they're being sold at, at uh, bargain prices. And, and that goes in, in spades for, for twins. Um, you take a look at a, like the airplane I fly, it's a Cessna 310. The Cessna 310 started production in 1955. You take a look at its uh, listings for Cessna 310s that are that, that were built in the 60s and, and they're almost giving them away. 
Um, and when they're giving them away, there's always a reason. Uh, there's no free lunch in aviation. Um, my advice to all but the most experienced aircraft buyers um, is to be wary of older airplanes, early model years, particularly older complex airplanes, because older airplanes can easily turn into a money pit. And that is maybe precisely why the airplane's for sale and why it's for sale at a very low price. Um, a lot of people figure, well, if the price is low enough, I can buy it and then spend some money refurbishing it and turning it into something really snazzy. Um, that may be true if you're planning to keep the plane for a long time, uh, but if you're not planning to keep it for the foreseeable future, um, if you put a bunch of money in refurbishing an airplane, only a small fraction of the money you invest in refurbishing will be reflected in the fair market value. It's still going to be an early model airplane. Even if it's got beautiful paint, interior, and really nice panel, if it's a 1959 Cessna 310, it's not going to be worth very much. And so it's easy to get yourself seriously underwater by over improving an older airplane. Um, the other big problem with older airplanes is that they just get increasingly unmaintainable over time. Um, parts become scarce. In some cases, parts are not available. Uh, my airplane is not that old as airplanes go. It's a 79 model, but there's still components on my airplane that, you know, if I need a replacement, I'm going to have to go to a salvage yard and try to find one because, you, you, you know, you can't, you can't buy new ones and you can't buy PMA replacements. Also, as the airplanes get older and older, fewer mechanics are interested in working on them. So um, maintenance may be a problem. Um, so, you know, unless you're an A&P with a lot of time on your hands looking for a project, my advice is generally to buy the, the latest model year you can reasonably afford um, and to avoid aircraft in which you're going to have to invest a lot of money uh, in refurbishing. I mean, most airplanes that you buy nowadays, you can probably have to put at least a little money into bringing the panel up to up to date. But um, you, you just you don't want to buy an airplane and invest a whole lot of money in it unless you're planning to keep it forever. And if you're buying your first airplane, it's probably not a good idea to buy an airplane that you plan to keep forever. You want to buy an airplane that you can learn on. Talk about worn paint interior. That's another thing that that first time buyers tend to get all hung up on cosmetics. Um, I say, don't hesitate to buy an airplane just because the paint or interior are getting long in the tooth. It's actually in some ways an advantage um, because uh, the paint interior is very much like engines. The, 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 the condition of the paint interior is usually pretty accurate reflected in the selling price of the airplane. Um, so if you buy an airplane that, that needs new paint and new interior and then plan on buying it and then and having that done, um, you're probably going to spend about as much money on that airplane as if you had bought one that cost more because it had really nice paint and interior. And just like the engine, the nice thing is, you know, if, if you redo the paint and interior, buy the airplane less expensively uh, because it's got cosmetic issues and then deal with the cosmetics yourself, you know, you get to pick the paint colors. Uh, you get to pick the upholstery materials or probably your significant other gets to pick them, but wh whatever, you, you wind up getting what you want rather than what the, the seller wanted. Um, but as I said, the condition of paint interiors tell, tends to be well reflected in the selling price, just like the agent of the engine. Um, so uh, it's it's usually a pretty good financial deal to do that. What really counts is, you know, what's what's under the floorboards and back of the tail cone, not not the not the cosmetics. Um, and I would buy a sound, uh, you know, mechanically sound corrosion-free airplane with terrible paint interior and a heartbeat, because that's that's easy to fix. And uh, and, and the cost of doing that will, will be reflected in a discounted price. So you've, you, you, you've gone through all of this, you've finally picked a 
aircraft that you want to buy, you make an offer on it. Uh, the seller accepts your offer. You sign a conditional purchase sale agreement with the seller that gives you the right to do a pre-buy on the aircraft. And so now you do the pre-buy. Maybe maybe you come to my company and we help manage the pre-buy. And the pre-buy results in a list of discrepancies found, which is almost always the case. You know, you, you, we always find problems with airplanes when we do pre-buy. Sometimes we find worse problems than others, but but that's that's why we do a pre-buy to find out what the discrepancies of the airplane is. So you find this airplane, you, you like it a lot, you, you have a pre-buy done by a trustworthy, knowledgeable mechanic, and the pre-buy turns up some significant mechanical discrepancies. So now what do you do? Well, that's that's easy. But first, you have the pre-buy mechanic uh, give you a list of the discrepancies in writing. Uh, with estimated cost of parts and labor to correct each one. Then you take that document and you send a copy of it to the seller. And you say, we found the following problems. And um, I'm going to have to ask you to reduce the purchase price to cover the cost of repairing those problems. If the seller agrees, you got a deal. If the seller doesn't agree, you walk away from the deal and you find another airplane. Now, the, the, the you know, the, question is exactly what discrepancies are you going to ask the seller to sell or to pay for and we'll talk about that in a second but um occasionally we'll run into a a discrepancy you know corrosion damage to a wing spar for example it may be so costly to repair that it'll just be an instant deal killer and we try to structure pre-buy so that we look for that stuff first uh, because if there if there's a deal killer we 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 don't want to spend a whole lot of money doing a thorough pre-buy. We, we want to find the deal, deal killers as early as we can so that we can walk away from the deal and not have spent any more money on this pre-buy than necessary because the pre-buy is, is, is an expense to the, to the prospective buyer. Um, we don't often find deal killers on relatively recent model airplanes. Uh, the older the airplane model, the more likely it is that there's going to be a deal killer found during the pre-buy. But most discrepancies, you know, a cylinder with bad compression or an inoperative autopilot servo or something that's found during the pre-buy should be, you know, readily resolvable. And it's important to understand that the, 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 the basic uh, principle here is that normally the seller should bear the cost of resolving any airworthiness discrepancies and the buyer, um, should bear the cost of resolving any non-airworthiness discrepancies, any cosmetic or other non-airworthiness items. Um, the, the principle being that if you buy a used airplane, you're not entitled to receive a perfect airplane, but you are entitled to receive an airworthy airplane. So if there are things that are unairworthy on the airplane that are found during the pre-buy, the seller should bear the cost of correcting that. Note that you don't want the seller to fix those problems. You know, you, you want to get the seller out of the picture just as quickly as you can if you want to buy this airplane. What you want him to do is to lower his price uh, to compensate you for paying to, to, to fix those problems. Um, and when you sign a conditional purchase sale agreement with the seller after you've made an offer on the airplane and he's accepted it and before you do the pre-buy, um, all of this stuff should be explicit in the agreement as to, you know, what happens if airworthiness discrepancies are found that the seller has the option to either reduce his price by the amount uh, the estimated amount to correct those problems or to say the deals off and take his airplane back um, but that should all be covered explicitly in the agreement that you uh, come up with with the with the seller and uh, one of the things that we often wind up doing is um, is, is coaching our prospective buyers on what the wording of the conditional purchase sale agreement should be. Because especially if the, if the sale includes a broker uh, who's representing the seller, uh, the broker will typically present the buyer with a purchase sale agreement that's, that's very biased in favor of the seller and against the buyer. And we don't, we don't want our, our, our people signing agreements like that. So um, we, we typically do, do sometimes do a little negotiation on what's going to be in that agreement. 
Um, but it's important to go into this pre-buy process with the, the notion that it's not an all or nothing deal. Either the airplane's perfect, or you're gonna walk away. It, you're gonna find some problems and generally the, the, those problems are, are resolvable between buyer and seller. Um, I, I've seen some really stupid things happen. I remember one case uh, in, in which uh, we were representing a prospective buyer of a, of a half a million dollar SESTA 421C pressurized cabin class twin. Um, during the pre-buy, they discovered that the that, that two cylinders had, had low compression and were going to have to be replaced. And the, the buyer walked away from the deal. Well, I mean, that's, that's nuts. You, you don't walk away from a deal on a half a million dollar airplane because two cylinders need to be replaced. Um, in another case, this one, this one I just couldn't believe. It was a Cirrus SR22 is a $350,000 sale. And the buyer and seller got wrapped around the axle because they, they couldn't agree whether the Bose headsets were going to be included in the purchase. And ultimately, the, 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 the buyer got so mad that he walked away over a headset. I mean, that's, that's just nuts. And in both cases, the deal breaking dispute was over something that represented less than 1% of the purchase price. That, that, that makes no sense. You know, good, clean, mechanically sound, corrosion free airplanes are getting harder and harder to find. Um, so don't let a good one go get away because of a problem that's easy to fix. Uh, th this, you're just dollars away from a solution. You just negotiate uh, an acceptable um, amendment to the price. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, generally the seller wants to sell, the buyer wants to buy. Um, th they can usually come to, to agreement if they approach it with a constructive attitude. Well, Charlie, that's all the... Uh, prepared material I have, but we can throw it over for some questions if you like. Absolutely, Mike. Great talk. Lots to consider. Okay, Mark, I'll start us off. Would you can, would you characterize the 2020 surge in GA transaction as a seller's market or a buyer's market? Or in other words, were planes generally selling at higher or lower than asking price? Well, you know, that's kind of a hard um, question. I, I I'm not uh, I'm not in the appraisal business, so I haven't I typically don't focus that much on on prices as I do on things like airworthiness and so on because that's just the business I'm in. My, my general impression is that it sort of started as a buyer's market where where, where sellers were unloading airplanes and and. But it's gradually transitioned now to 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 more of a seller's market where the prices have have gone up quite a bit. Um, the, the demand is sort of outstripping the supply. That's my general impression, but I have to caveat it in that I'm not the you know that the the, the whole issue of valuation is not really my area of expertise. I sort of have a theory about what happened. But, but I don't really have any way of proving it. My theory is that, you know, the COVID thing created a lot of winners and losers. You know, if, 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 you, if, if you had a, um, a, a restaurant, you were probably a loser, but if you had a drive-through, you were a winner, you know, or if you were, you know, Zoom communications, you were a winner. So my sense is that a lot of people got really hurt financially by COVID and a lot of people did very well under COVID and the people who were hurt, the first thing they they they, they were going to sell was their airplanes and and there was always a you know a willing buyer uh, for every airplane that's sold there has to be one that's bought. So that's kind of my theory but I, I don't have any way of, of proving it but you know my general sense now is that I, th I think this this huge number of airplanes that was changing hands this summer was kind of COVID driven, but I think right now aviation just seems to be on a on, on a, a roll because people are dying to travel. They've been cooped up for a year. People don't want to be on the airlines. <laughs> really good, really good argument for having your own airplane. Um, they're just a lot of things that are conspiring to, to uh, light a fire under aviation. Okay, David asks, 
how can we find out the annual maintenance costs of a candidate aircraft? Um, well, uh, one good way actually um, is, and, and I'm a very big believer in these things, is to go to the type club for that particular kind of airplane. Um, most of these airplanes, let's say you're interested in a Grumman Tiger, there's a, there's a very active, uh, you know, Grumman um, owners group uh, that you can find online. Uh, it's probably a good idea to join the group, you know, probably 30 or 40 bucks a year to, to, to become a member. Then you get on, on, their, on their chat boards and there's a whole lot of Grumman owners there and you can you can ask them, you know, what do you guys usually spend on an annual inspection and, you know, what's your, what are your operating costs and you get a whole lot of answers and you get a, a good feel for it. I'm a big believer in type clubs as, as being an excellent source of, of type specific information like that. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about the type clubs. Okay, Valerie has uh, the question of, what if I'm a first time buyer with my heart set on a vintage airplane? If I stubbornly insist on buying what I want, what mistakes do I risk making? How do I manage those risks and mistakes? Well, you know, the, the, the vintage airplane has the, the problem of it being vintage, but it, it, but it probably doesn't have the problem of it being excessively complex. So it's it, it was probably not a horrible uh, choice because at least it's a relatively simple airplane. Um, I, I think the the two things that I would suggest right off the bat, one, not to sound like a broken record, but but see if there's an owner association uh, so that you can hook up with other owners of that same make and model airplane. And the other is, um, do some research to find out if you can find somebody who's willing to maintain it because not every shop is going to be interested in working on a vintage airplane especially if it's you know for example a wooden fabric or something like that because not not every mechanic is equipped to do that uh, and also uh, do some research and make sure that you can get insurance for it um, because sometimes owners first time buyers will get into an airplane and then suddenly discover that they can't get insurance for it. So, you know, basically do your due diligence and try to find a, a, a an owner association where you can hook up with other owners of the same make and model and, and exchange thoughts. And you, that's a really good way to learn a, a lot from other people who have been on the same journey that you're about to take. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I mean, there's a big, gamut there vintage can be everything from an antique you know with a big round radial engine to you know something like i you know i started off with a champ and uh champ's pretty straightforward aircraft but to your point not every mechanic's going to work on a fabric covered airplane anymore yeah of course of course my Cessna three my 79 Cessna 310 is probably getting pretty close to being vintage <laughs> <laughs> and, and i know that i know that i'm vintage so I yeah, be, well, we, <laughs> I may be past vintage. I may be antique. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Ron asks, uh, does a constant speed prop make it more difficult for a low time pilot to get insurance? And I guess I'd just add any maintenance uh, thoughts as well. I don't think that's a big factor. That's that's not really what insurance companies are worried about. I, insurance companies, um, they, I'll give you the big ones. They They, they, they don't like retractables because they, they spend an awful lot of money uh, paying for gear ups. They don't like twins and they don't like tail draggers. <laughs> um, that's not to say that they won't insure them. It's just to say that you can, you, you'll expect to, to pay a premium for them. And if you're a long time pilot, you may not be able to get insured until you have a certain amount of time and type. Um, but those are the three big things that jump out at me that I know insurance companies don't like. They don't like retractables, they don't like twins, they don't like tail draggers. I don't think a constant free prop would, would affect your insurance rate at all, really. It's not, it's not a, a big issue because it doesn't, it's not a source of claims, which is what the insurance companies are worried about. Okay, and Randall asks, when you say older complex aircraft, how would you define complex? 
Um, well, I don't, I don't want to, to uh, define it in any formal way, um, but, but uh, you know, a complex airplane is just one with a lot of moving parts. Um, certainly, a, a, you know, a twin is a, is, is a complicated airplane. Um, retractable is, is certainly more complicated um, and, and has both some maintenance implications and also some insurance implications compared to a fixed gear airplane. Um, the, the um, and, and, you know, even within that, you know, the, if you, if you're looking at a retractable airplane, the retraction system on a Bonanza is way, way simpler and easy to maintain than the retraction system on a Cessna 210, which uh, baffles most mechanics because it's very, very complicated. And, and unless you're really well trained in the system, it's very hard to troubleshoot. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of depends, but, but I, I think of complexity sort of more in terms of, you know, how many parts does this airplane have that we have to worry about? Okay, William asks, what about damage repair and repaired airplanes? What is acceptable and what is walk away? Well, you know, that's a, that's a really good uh, question. Um, I tend to encourage, uh, um, let, let, me, let me start off by saying um, many buyers, particularly first time buyers, will not consider an airplane with quote unquote damage history. It just spooks them. Um, to me, the, the damage history, and I've actually written some articles on this, of a damage history. First of all, if an airplane was damaged and it was properly repaired, it's gonna be every bit as good as new, but it's probably going to have a, a lower price in the market not because it's in any way inferior, but because a lot of buyers are spooked by damage history so that there's less demand for an airplane with damage history. So you can often get a really, really good deal on an airplane that has damage history compared to an identical airplane that doesn't have. And the one with damage history, if it, if it was repaired properly, um, is, is every bit as good. Um, the other thing is that people use damage history in the weirdest ways. I mean, the, the, the people will sometimes consider a prop strike as being damage history, which is ridiculous. To me, a prop strike is an opportunity. It's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not kind of looking for a prop strike, but when a prop strike happens, a lot of owners will come to me. They say, oh, my God, I just you know took out a, an orange cone and I curled a blade on my prop. And now my airplane has damage history. And oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I say, you know, this isn't a problem. This is an opportunity. What, what you have just done is you have gotten um, your engine to be um, opened up and 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 redone at, you know, subsidized by your insurance company. You don't have to pay for it, and it's going to be better than new when you're done. Um, it, it, you know, prop strikes not damage history. Um, I, you know, the. There are cases where, let's say there's been a severe case of hangar rash. Somebody backed an airplane into a hangar and smashed a rudder. And the rudder was a mess, and it was determined the best way to repair it was to uh, to go find another rudder in, in the salvage yard and put it on. So does that airplane have damage history? I mean, there's no trace of the damage left. The The, the damaged rudder is 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 now in a scrap heap someplace it's not on the airplane anymore i wouldn't consider that to be damage history but most people would they'll look in the logs and they'll discover that you know somebody smashed up the rudder and got replaced they say this is a damage history airplane so i i tend to you know be favorably disposed towards uh, airplanes with damage history if the damage was is either gone because whatever got damaged got replaced or whether, or if the damage was properly repaired, where it's it's at least as good as new. Okay, and kind of a semi-related question. Mark asks, are there any concerns with buying an airplane with modified modified by an STC? Um, 
not necessarily that you you have to be a little bit careful um, because there are a lot of STCs whose STC holders no longer exist. So if it's an STC that that either that that that, that doesn't have a support problem, I mean, for example, your your Cessna 172 got retrofitted with a 180 horsepower engine under an STC. Um, that's no problem because you know it's it's a, it's a 180 horsepower light combing engine. It's well supported by light combing. Whoever whoever provided the STC, if 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 he gets run over by a truck, it's no skin off your nose because you don't need him again. Um, uh, you know, on, on the other hand, uh, there are STCs like like for example, um, uh, oh, just pick one out of the air. There was a a very extensive STC modification of the Cessna 182 called the Ren that 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 put all sorts of of, of um, stall stuff on it. It, it. it had spoilers. It had uh, it, it it had flaperons. It had all sorts of things, and it was made it into a real super stall airplane. But the problem is that that nobody supports those things anymore. So. It, it you you have an airplane with with a bunch of non-standard parts on it, and if God forbid you need to replace a part, you're going to be in a world of hurt because there aren't a whole lot of runs around. You're probably not going to find a lot of Wren parts in salvage yards, and the company that that came up with the Wren is 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 long gone. So you have to be just a little bit careful about what STC it is. But th there's there's not a, really a problem with a with most STCs. It's it's just if if the STC is one where lack of support is, is going to be a problem. And, and I guess we should define what an STC is. We kind of jumped into the deep end. No, it's a, the STC is a supplemental type certificate. If, if, you, if, if you have a certificated airplane and you want to alter it, and if the alteration is one that is considered to be a major alteration, um, then you have to then the alteration has to be done with FAA approved data. And the normal way you get that FAA approved data is to buy it from a company that, that has gotten it approved. Um, and, and what they have done is gone to the FAA, got them to approve their modification, their made major alteration, and issued what's called a supplemental type certificate or STC. And they own the intellectual property to that modification. You basically are buying the, the the right to use that modification. Often you're also buying parts from them to make the modification, um, and, and that's an STC. The, the other way you can make a major alteration to a certificate airplane is is to is to go to the FAA and apply for a field approval, which is a one-time approval the, just for that modification on your own airplane. Um, and field approvals are getting harder and harder to get over time. So most of the time when we do major modifications of airplanes, we do it um, using an STC that some, somebody has spent the money to develop and get approved. Okay, and Matthew asks, is there a good way of vetting maintenance shops? Oh yeah, that's 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 hard. And that's something that my company spends a lot of effort doing because we work with hundreds and hundreds of maintenance shops all over the country. And we keep a big database of our experiences with those shops. We even have like a proprietary Google map where we can zoom in on Sheep Dip, Nebraska and see all the shops that we know of within 100 nautical miles. And the good ones are coded in green and the bad ones are coded in red. But it's, it's, it's that's difficult. Um, Again, the one of the best ways for an owner to do that is to uh, is is through Type Club and um, to to try to hook up with other owners that have used that shop and find out what their experiences were, whether they were good experiences or bad experiences. Yeah, and I would just chime in and say also if you're a member of like the local EA chapter, a lot of times through asking around with your at the chapter meeting, like, you know, what mechanics they like, you know, you can get some real good insight yeah. on that as well. Okay. 
several questions about this. I'm just going to pick James's. Are there more things to watch out for when looking to buy a, a used experimental amateur built versus a certified aircraft? Do you want to touch I, that one, Mike? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to take the fifth on that because we we don't do pre-buys on experimentals. It's just outside of our area of expertise. Okay. So, but, 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 but Charlie, feel free to, <laughs> to chime in because that's your bailiwick, not mine. It is, but I, it's your presentation. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that one for tonight. So Paul asks, how do you compare aging of composite airframes like the Cirrus of the Diamond from metal airplanes like most of the others? Does high time present the same concerns or have we gotten there yet, I guess? Well, you know, I don't think that anybody knows, um, but I do have a, a little bit of knowledge, uh, particularly about the Cirrus, and, and I think pretty much everything that I have to say about the Cirrus would apply to other semi-recent vintage um, uh, composite airplanes like the Diamond or the, the, the what used to be the Columbia. Uh, and then became the Cessna something or other besides before Cessna dropped it. Um, I, I know that when, first of all, it, it, one of the things that's important to understand is that most of the general aviation fleet was certificated under an old set of rules called CAR3. And if you own a Cessna 182 or a Cherokee or a Cessna 310 like mine or a Bonanza or pretty much any airplane that was, you know, designed in the 1980s or earlier, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a CAR-3 airplane. The old the CAR stands for Civil Aeronautic Regulations, I guess, and, and the old CAR-3 certification regulations did not consider aging aircraft issues. Back in those days, people tended to buy airplanes every 10 years like they do, like they buy cars and it just never was really an issue. Um, airplanes that were certified uh, more recently than that, say from 1980-ish on, were certified under a newer set of regulations called FAR Part 23. And airplanes that were certified under Part 23 um, part of the certification requirements are that the that 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 the manufacturer had to prove to the FAA that these airplanes would not come apart when they got old. And and there was there there were several different ways that 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 the FAA allowed manufacturers to meet that requirement. Um, but probably the most commonly used way um, was to set a life limit. So, for example, the you know when the the Cirrus was first for certified, the whole airplane had a life limit set on it that was I don't remember, but four or five thousand hours. Um, and of course, there weren't any Cirruses that were anywhere close to that at the time. And by the time Cirruses were in the field long enough to get close to four or five thousand hours, Cirrus had gotten the FAA to increase that life limit. And there's still a life limit on the airplane, but it's a lot higher than that now. But the idea of a life limit is to say we're going to solve the, air, uh, the aging airplane issue by throwing away the airplane when it gets past a certain age. Um, there are other ways you can meet the requirement. You can you can add extra structure and prove to the FAA that your structure is fail safe and that you can hacksaw through any major uh, structural member in the airplane will still meet certification specs. But most people don't do that because it's it's heavy. Um, and then there's a third way of doing it that's called damage tolerance, but I, I won't go into that. At any rate, the, 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 the newer airplanes, and a lot of these composite airplanes are, are fall under part 23, like the Cirrus and the Diamond and so on. Um, part of their certification is, a, is a basically a guarantee that, that they won't fall apart when they get old. Um, and, and one way they do that is to say, we're not going to let them get older than, than a certain certain age. So how, how did Cirrus uh, get the FAA to approve a life limit of 5,000 hours and then later approve a life limit of 12,000 hours or whatever it is now? Well, the way they did that was they, they, they took 
a, a, a Cirrus airframe and they put it on a big jig up in Duluth, Minnesota with a bunch of big hydraulic actuators that would flex the bejesus out of the airframe and do it 24 seven. And they had a clock running and they just beat the heck out of this airframe 24 7 365 and the deal was that for every hour that that airframe survived without developing some sort of cracks or whatever the faa would grant them a third of an hour of life limit so if the faa approved the life limit of 5,000 hours on the cirrus it meant that that they had torture tested this thing for 15,000 hours and it didn't it didn't break and then when they raised the life limit to 12,000 hours or if that's the right number I'd have to look it up that means that that they torture tested it for 36,000 hours and it didn't break so you can be pretty sure that these things aren't going to break <laughs> okay uh, is that okay of, is it, did I answer the question yeah a couple of questions here around uh incomplete log books um and then the other one is, should you get a copy of an SCC with the plane or 337 annotation good enough? Um, okay, let's take one at a time. The, the, the first one had to do with lost logbooks. Yep. And this is a problem we run into all the time, that, that, that airplanes are for sale and they, they don't have any logbooks before such and such a date. The logbooks have been lost. This is a fairly common problem. Sometimes they're lost laws, sometimes the you know the 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 owner gets divorced and the wife is very angry and steals a lot of books, <laughs> burns them or throws them in the fireplace. We've run into all sorts of cases. Um for, first of all, if an airplane doesn't have complete log books, that's another one of those things like damage history that, that just naturally um, will have a, a, a negative effect on fair market value just because buyers don't like to buy airplanes without complete log books. But from a regulatory standpoint, um, the, the FAA has some kind of interesting rules about maintenance records. And there's there's a regulation which is 91417, if memory serves, if anybody wants to look it up. That, that basically talks about what kinds of records an aircraft owner has to keep and how long he has to keep them. And one very common class of maintenance records, which consists of pretty much all of the usual logbook entries of repairs, maintenance, alteration, inspections, um, all of that kind of stuff. The FAA only requires be kept for a maximum of one year. Uh, or until the maintenance operation involved is repeated. So when you do an annual inspection on an airplane, all the records of previous annuals become moot in, in terms of the FAA's eyes. They don't care whether you keep them or burn them or, or whatever. And that's true of almost all of the logbook entries that, that mechanics sign off. We, we're, we're only required by regulation to keep them for a year. Now, it's not to say that's a good idea to throw them out after a year, because if you do, you're, you're, you're going to have a negative effect on the fair market value of the airplane. Because even if the FAA doesn't care whether you have all the records, a prospective buyer would probably care and, and they would probably value your airplane less if the records are incomplete. Um, but there is another class of maintenance records um, that we're supposed to keep forever. Um, and the most important uh, part of those is records of compliance with airworthiness directives. So if, if you lost all, the, if, if you look at an airplane and all the log books prior to 1975 got lost, um, and there are some old ADs prior to 1975 that nobody can prove that they were complied with because the maintenance records are lost. Then when that airplane goes in for an annual inspection, an IA who's one of his jobs is to make sure that all applicable ADs have been complied with. 
will look and say, well, I can't find any record that AD, you know, 690127 was complied with because that came out in 1969 before 1975 when you lost all the logbooks. So I'm going to have to recomply with, with that um, AD because I have to assume that it wasn't complied with. Now, that's all, not always necessary. Some ADs, you can kind of look at the airplane and see if it was complied with. If, if the AD required you know, adding a, a doubler to a certain location, you can look and see if the doubler is there. Um, but sometimes you can't tell. I mean, so, or sometimes it's very, very difficult to tell. One of the famous ones was there's an AD requiring certain centered oil pump gears in Lycoming engines to get replaced. And, and you know, you, you can't tell whether that was complied with if you don't have records unless you tear the engine down. Um, so th the, the biggest problem we have with lost records is loss of proof that, that, that older ADs were complied with. Most of the records, if you lose them, they, they, they just have an adverse effect on the fair market value, but they don't cause you any big operational problems. But there are certain kinds of records that it's painful to lose, and AD compliance um, is uh, is is one of the main ones. Okay, and then Anthony had the question about should you expect a copy of the STC with a plane, or is a 337 annotation good? Well, the 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 337, um, you know, will show that the that 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 the alteration was was made and it was signed off by an IA and even if the even if you've lost a copy of the 337 337s have to be prepared in duplicate and one copy goes to the aircraft owner the other copy goes to the FAA and is kept on file in Oklahoma City and and so you can call up the FAA and this is a really good idea if you're in, if you're even vaguely interested in buying an airplane you can you can go to the uh, the records branch in uh, Oklahoma City, and for I don't know six bucks or ten bucks or something, you can get everything that the FAA knows about this aircraft on a on a CD-ROM, um, including all of the 337s that they have on file. And theoretically, if 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 a major alteration was made or a major repair. Um, there should be a copy of that 337 in, in the aircraft maintenance records, but there also should be a copy in Oak City. And it, when we order the CD-ROM, it's very common to find that the FAA has records that the owner doesn't have, and the owner has records the FAA doesn't have. And if, if you look at both of them, you probably can get a pretty good idea of, of, of what happened. Now, originally, the only thing you needed was the 337. Um, and then sometime, I forget when it was, but maybe 20 years ago or something, they came out with this new rule that said that uh, to, to do an STC, you're supposed to have a letter of authorization from the STC holder saying that, that, that you got this STC legitimately, you didn't steal it or borrow a copy from somebody else, but you actually you, you paid the STC developer for the right to use it. Um, and theoretically, you're supposed to have that in your maintenance records, but um, I've never really heard of anybody getting in trouble for not being able to come up with a letter of authorization. So if, if that got lost, it's, it's probably not that big a deal. Um, and again, if, an, if a 337 got lost, there's, there's a fair chance that, that, that it may still be on file with the STC in Oak City and get a copy by, by ordering the CD-ROM. All right, Mike, another great talk. Uh, any closing thoughts? We're running out of time. Oh, well, you're the one that was metering out the question. Don't blame me for running out of time. <laughs> well, you well, have I more questions have, than we can I, answer. I don't, have, I don't have much to say. Uh, my, my books are still available on Amazon. You said several books. It's actually four books. And the, the first book, Manifesto, is also available on an audio book. And I'm working on developing an audiobook for the second book, or the engines book. Um, and uh, oh, and uh, if you check the box on the post webinar survey that Charlie's going to put up for you, 
or you go to the Savvy Aviation website and, and, and click on the, the button, you can get on my newsletter list. Uh, we send out a lot of really interesting maintenance related stuff uh, to those on our mailing list. We've got, I think, 33,000 people on our mailing list right now. But if you're not on it, you can, it's easy to get on it. And um, finally, the, my next three first Wednesday of the month webinars. Um, next month, we're going to be talking about going beyond TBO. Uh, in August, we're going to be talking about um, uh, misfueling of uh, uh, piston aircraft with Jet A and what happens when that happens. I, I, I had that happen to me some years ago, and I learned some very interesting lessons about it, which I didn't get taught in any of my pilot training. And finally, in uh, in September, uh, I'm going to be doing a talk on some of some really state of the art stuff that we've been working on, and, and uh, um, using machine learning techniques to analyze uh, engine monitor data from from aircraft and to predict uh, to, to to predict incipient uh, failures, engine failures. It's it's some pretty interesting stuff. So um, that's that's all I have, Charlie. Until next. Till next month. Great, Mike. Thanks so much. By the way, that newsletter, I love that one that you just ran on the borescope. Oh. Uh, that was very informative. So it is definitely a good newsletter to be a, a subscriber to. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. And if you haven't bought your tickets for Air Venture 2021, you ought to put that on your to-do list. So have a great evening. I got my tickets. Good night, right. everybody. Well, I will see you in 53 <laughs> days, Mike. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it.